Well, I hope you are in a good mood. Uh, if you're not, uh, just tell yourself, you know what? I'm going to be in a good mood. I'm in a good mood today. And I think the reason I'm in a good mood is for whatever reason, some of the people around me have just decided to be extremely generous. And I am I am dressed head to toe in, in gifts. Uh, this shirt, I'm breaking a cardinal rule. You are not supposed to wear white, but I think the, the I think the justification is worth it because I get to rep Live the Dream Media gear. Live the Dream Media puts all of this on, whether it's for us at here at Vision or local Marana or your digital church. Uh, there's so many different people in this community that have a chance to share their story because of what Live the Dream Media is doing. And I had a chance to snag me a shirt and I said, you absolutely bet I'm going to be doing that. And not to mention this hat. This hat was given to me this morning by my guy, Richard Lopez, over with FCA. We've been talking. We get together every couple of weeks for our hour of power breakfast, and it really is just straight discipleship. He helps me. I hopefully help him. And what I love about these two different places, whether it is Live the Dream Media or FCA, CA, what they are committed to, what they are doing is they are getting beyond their walls and they are getting into the community and they are trying to make the place a better, a be just a better place to live. And as I look at what my role is in the church and what I'm supposed to be doing and how that is really the charge that the church has been given. And I had somebody ask me this week, you know, what, what, what are we doing to, to follow suit? Preaching about it. We're talking about it. But what are we doing to follow suit? And uh, I know what the answer should be. I do know what the answer should be. I got a pretty good idea. And I've had it for quite a while. But it has been one thing that's kept me from going forward. And the thing that keeps me from going forward, I, is, I believe, is the same thing that keeps you from going forward. And I want to talk about what that one thing is. But let's pray before we jump in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Oftentimes, we try to dress up what we're willing to listen to from you. And if it fits within alignment of my expectations, well then cool, I'll open myself up and I'll listen to it. But if I ever experience something outside of my expectations, well then I, I don't know if that's from you and maybe that's even from the enemy. And I pray that we crucify that line of thinking and that we walk into every situation with anticipation, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's awkward, even if it's unfortunate, even if it's something undesirable, if we're willing to open ourselves up and trust that you are good and know that you are good and believe that you are good and have faith that you are good, that we can find the wisdom in situations that go within our expectations or outside of our expectation. It helps us to approach with anticipation. And so I pray that we approach this sermon. I pray that we approach everything with anticipation, that you are a good God and that you have put us in position and that the thing that stops us from stepping into where you've placed us, I pray that we get that out of the way so that we can be all about the ministry of reconciliation. And we're going to talk about what that is. But thank you for this message. Thank you for today. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. You heard me mention that there is one thing that I think gets in the way of whether it's me or you or just us as people. There's something that God has laid out for us to do. There is a place that God has positioned us, an opportunity that he has given us. And for whatever reason, we get in our own head and we get in our own, own way and we stop. And the reason that we stop is fear. We know what we should do. We can even see how it should be done. But because it's countercultural or because it's not what everyone else thinks that you should be doing or because it may create waves or because it's un, it's, it's, there's fear of the unknown, whatever it is, we stop dead in our tracks. And fear will do that. Fear will take, I don't care who you are or where you come from, fear can paralyze you. I don't know what your fears are. I got three of them. Three, three that will, will scare the daylights out of me. Two that probably won't shock you. One might actually make you scratch your head a little bit. The, the one fear that I have, I don't care. I don't care. I mean, I was a police officer. David, he, he's, he's helping me get, get this going right now. He was a police officer. I can't think of many times where I was afraid to go into a building where there was an adversary. Hey, you know what? If it, Don't pray for me. Pray for the guy I'm going in after because bad day for him if I have to go in there. Kobe Bryant has this phrase. If you ever see me and a bear in a fight, pray for the bear. Most police officers have that same mindset of I'm going in there and don't pray for me, pray for whoever I'm going in after because if I have to do my job, um, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to win this fight, I'm trying to end it. And so not afraid, not afraid. And I'd have that mentality all the time until you put me up high somewhere like on a ladder or on a roof or heights. I don't care how brave a person can get or at least how brave I can get. You put me on a ladder and I start shaking. I hate heights. I don't like being by the edge of things. I, I just don't like heights. 
I think the most unbearable part of being up high or at least getting climbing a ladder is the transfer either off the ladder onto the roof or off the roof onto the ladder. I hate it. I don't like it. I always picture the ladder going down and maybe it's because I fell one time and broke my wrist. I don't know, but I don't like heights. That's one of the fears that will take all of the color out of my body. I will lose all feeling and I just freeze. I don't like heights. Um, the second one is snakes. I do not like snakes. Um, I don't know how you feel about snakes. Some people love them. Some people hate them. I say there's only one uh, there's only one kind of snake I like or only one one kind of snake that I want to be around in, but it offends people when I say it, so I'm not going to say it. But there's only one type of snake that I like to be around, and it's one that is not around me. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but the third fear, the third fear, first two may not shock you, but the, the third one might kind of make you scratch your head a little bit. And there's actually a phobia that's attached to this. It's called a, oh gosh, I wrote it down. What's it called? Cancerophobia. Cancerophobia, or sorry, not cancerophobia, carcerophobia. Carcerophobia is the is this fear. You're like, what's carcerophobia? Carcerophobia is the fear of going to jail. I am afraid of going to jail. And you might be like, well, don't do anything wrong. You don't have to worry about it. See, that's the problem. That's the problem. I was a cop for 13 years. And there was something that I learned very early on in my career that I, be, I know it changed me professionally, but to be honest with you, I believe it changed my personality. Because early on in my career, I would be thrust into situations where people were going back and forth and there was, there was high emotion. And when emotion is high, logic is low. And I discovered what being on the receiving end of somebody crying will do to you. When you walk up and you get to hear someone's side of the story and they're crying and they're emotional and they're pointing fingers and you're not this or they're not that or they did this and they're crying and they're worked up. Something inside of you just gets triggered because what you want to do is make it all better. What you want to do is help. And you feel it like your empathy just gets dialed up to a thousand. And all you want to do is help this person and make them stop crying and make them stop dealing with this. And you almost go like, I'm going to fix this. And so your emotions go high and your logic goes low. And what I discovered early on in my career is how powerful manipulation can be, how deceiving emotion can be. Because I would make an arrest and it was, a, it was what I, based on the evidence I had at the time, what I thought was the right thing. But I would discover as these would go to court or these would go to trial is early on in my career, cases were getting dismissed. And I learned and I had a good sergeant pull me aside and say, you're making decisions based off of emotion, not evidence. And you need to learn how not to do that. And that changed me because I started thinking of some of the people who, well, I was well-meaning, well-intended, not intentional, but nonetheless, I did what we call in law enforcement, the habeas grabius. I would put handcuffs on somebody put them in the backseat of my car and I would drive them to jail only to have them be found not guilty. And one of the things that has really, I think, created this fear for me or created some guilt in my life is while I didn't intentionally do it, these are people who had to get a mugshot taken. These are people who had to spend a night in jail. These are people who are still stuck with that memory. These are people who have to now live and look in the mirror of, I did go to jail. I didn't do anything, but I did go to jail. And that messes with your mind. That'll mess with your head. And, I, and like I told you, I, I know it changed me professionally, but I actually also know that it changed me. It changed my personality. Um, it made me very slow to engage a situation. And uh, there's actually a psychology behind this because I wanted to understand why, why, why is this happening to me? Why do I feel this way? And there's a psychology behind it. And the way I know that it's changed my personality and I learned is that depending on what side of the fence somebody is on, is it'll tell you what label they're going to throw at you because I have been very slow at this point to place accusation or place judgment upon somebody. I've been very slow to point the finger at somebody and say, and find fault. And depending on what side of the fence you're on, you will either look at me going, man, you need to do something about this. You're being way too passive. Or you will be on the other side of the fence and go, man, you are calloused. You are cold. This person is crying and you're just staring at them. Depends on the side of the fence that you're on. We'll explain the psychology. The psychology will explain that. And ultimately what it reveals is that it's confusing. It's confusing. It's confusing to the people around. It's confusing to you. And confusion is what can very easily make an innocent person end up incarcerated. 
And so it changed my personality and in a good way, but nonetheless, it's it's caused me to think. And it's one of the reasons, I mean, honestly, this is one of the reasons I've never preached on Joseph's life. You've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph in Genesis, right? If you follow your way through. I've taught on Abraham, I've taught on Isaac, I've taught on Jacob, but I have yet to teach on Joseph. You want to know why? I think Joseph got screwed. I do. I look at Joseph's life and I go, I don't like what happened? It's like, oh, but it worked out in the end. You know, he was second in command to Pharaoh and he saved Egypt and his family from, from you know, from famine. And I'm like, yeah, great. But the methodology and the process that he had to go through to get there, I'm like, that guy just got the raw end of that deal. He got sold into slavery, number one. Not his fault. Yeah, he might have been a little mature, but he got sold into slavery. Life ruined. Then doing, making the sacrifices, doing the right things, honoring God, behaving the right way. Never, ever making accusations against his brothers, but, but obeying Potiphar, being a good steward, staying away from what he should have. That didn't stop, stop Potiphar's wife from pointing the finger at Joseph and accusing him of something that he didn't do. And it didn't stop the punishment from coming to Joseph where he ended up being thrown in prison. But even in prison, he still does what he's supposed to do, and he gets forgotten about in prison. And that bothers me. I don't like that. It upsets me as I look at this and I'm going like, man, this guy just got the raw end of the dream or of, of the of the situation. And, and, and the reason I said dream is because I have bad dreams about this. I have bad. I had one or about, about, about a week ago. I have bad dreams about ending up in prison or ending up in jail. I don't know why I'm there, but I'm there. And usually my wife or my kids are there visiting me and I'm embarrassed. I, I, I feel horrible. I'm like, just get away from me. I don't want to be around you. I hate the way that I feel doing that. I just cannot stand it. And usually when I wake up, it takes me, it takes me most of the morning to shake the way I feel. I have to go work out. I have to go do something. I just do not like the way that I feel. Fears do that to us. They are fears, whatever they may be, they change the way that we behave. They change the way that we operate. They change the way that we see the world. They change the way that we see other people. Oftentimes we will take a fear from a previous season and impart it or impose it on someone else. Fears just mess with our head. Those are my fears. What are your fears? Uh, I, t- I talked to some of my kids. I wanted to see what their fears are, and they found out that my my kids have a lot of the common fears that most people have. Uh, Caleb, he's our eight year old. His fear is getting lost. He tells me one time when I lost him in Walmart. I didn't lose him in Walmart. I walked around the other side of of the aisle, and he lost sight of me for about five seconds. But in his the way he tells that story is I, I lost him for two hours. But uh, the the fear of getting lost is mesophobia. Uh, I talked to Camden. He says that his, he says, I, I, that I just, I, he, he said like someone who's paralyzed, like, I don't want that. I would never want to be paralyzed. That's paral, that's paralophobia. Uh, the fear of being abandoned, autophobia. Some people are fear of be, being abandoned. I tell Angela all the time, you have to die. My, my wife, I said, listen, baby, you have to die first. Okay. You have to die first. Do not leave me here on this planet by myself. You have to, or sorry, I have to go first. Sorry, that's horrible. Do not take that out of context. David, we're editing that out. I have to go first. You, I, that's horrible. I cannot believe I said that wrong, but I'm leaving it in anyway. And uh, you can utilize it as blackmail. I don't care. But nonetheless, I tell my wife all the time, I have to go first. I have to go first. You cannot go first, babe. I love you. And you cannot go first. I have to go first. You cannot leave me here on this planet alone. That's autophobia. Uh, humiliation is a big one. That's, a, that's catagelophobia. Uh, the fear of being rejected. And I can't even say this one. Anthropophobia. I can't say anthropophobia, but the fear of being rejected, I can spot this one a mile away. P- this is a fear where people disqualify themselves before uh, to avoid the risk of being exposed. They disqualify themselves before they give someone else the chance to do so. They will walk in and they will say, you know what, before you can place judgment on me, I'm just going to step out. Before you can tell me I'm not good enough, I'm going to tell you all the reasons why I'm not good enough. I learned about this one as a coach, and uh, it actually, I, it really as a coach or as a parent, I learned the, about the fear of rejection and how we start to talk about ourselves. And anytime I see it, I will stop it and call it out immediately. I called it out of my son Camden just the other day. He's doing BMX, and we were heading down, and he just, you know, if you ever go to race or you ever go to play a game, you get those butterfly feelings, and, and he was having that. And he says, Dad, I got this feeling I'm just not going to do very good today. I just got this feeling I'm not going to do very good today. And it's that fear of, of rejection. He was rejecting himself before a result could do it or anyone else could do it. And I stopped it immediately. And I said, son, I'm going to love you whether you get first place or last place. 
your identity is not going to be in this result. Your identity is you are my son and I love you. And I'm trying to eliminate that fear of rejection in his life because whether it's his fears or your fears or my fears, our fears steal something from us. Our feel, our fears put us in a position that we were never created to be in. Your fear will first, and, and, and I wrote down some of the things that it'll steal from you. Your fear will steal joy. It'll steal your happiness. Your fear will steal uh, the love that you have for someone or something. Your fear will steal your peace that you, you know, I used to be such at peace and now I, I'm not there anymore. Your fear will steal patience that you used to have. It'll, it'll steal the kindness that you used to bestow on other people or yourself or those around you. It'll steal your generosity. It'll steal your faithfulness. It'll steal your gentleness and it'll even steal your self-control. And the things, if those sound familiar, the things I just listed to you are the nine fruits of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Fear will steal that. And after stealing those from you, fear will eventually kill you. It's a slow death, but it will eventually kill you. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Talking about the enemy, Satan. Satan comes to only steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, however, I have come that they, talking about mankind, may have life. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus says, I've come so that all people may have life. But not just have life, have it to the full. And this is the tension that we're stuck in. One side that's going to steal everything from you, the other thing that's going to not only give you life, but give it to the full, or give you life to the full. And as I've been looking at these two tensions, I had a bunch of different ideas of what I could call this sermon. But the problem that's plaguing mankind is this right here. This is the problem that's plaguing mankind. The fear of rejection, the fear of whatever has created this gap. The gap is the problem. That's why I was talking so much about FCA or Live the Dream Media. or It's why this conversation that I had, why it's bothering me so much, is why I wear this wristband a lot. Because these are different organizations that are working hard to close this gap. And it's convicting me because I'm talking about closing the gap. But what are we actually doing to close the gap? We can't keep doing the same things that we've been doing because the gap's not closing. So ultimately decided that there was a bunch of different things I could name the sermon. But I'm going to name the sermon what I believe God is speaking, at least in my life. And the title of the sermon is what I believe that we as a church, as the body of believers need to do. The title of the sermon is... Wake up. Wake up. And the sermon comes from Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 1 where it says, As for you, remember Paul is talking, and he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. You remember last week, Ephesians 2, 1 is a continuation from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23. Verse 23, Paul is talking about how Jesus is the head of the church, and then we as his as his as believers were the body, were the hands and feet of Jesus is a cohesive thing that works together. Jesus is the head. We, the church, not this church or that church, but the church, the called out gathered believers, the group of believers, not the individual ones watching on YouTube, the gathered believers who are in community somewhere with a group of fellow believers. Those are the hands and feet of Jesus. And verse 23 talks about how Jesus' authority fills everything in every way. That's the plan to solve this problem. The plan is to fill the, fill the space in every, everything in every way. We talked about last week how there's a realm outside this universe, right? You've got, this, you've got the first heaven here on earth. You've got the second heaven in outer space. And then you have the third heaven where outside of the universe where Jesus is. That's where Jesus is. It's paradise. And chapter 2, verse 1 sets the stage, right? Chapter 1, verse 23 sets the stage. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, as for you. Talking to believers, as for you, you were dead. You were dead. You were subjugated to the enemy's attack where he was trying to steal, kill, and destroy you. You were dead. Past tense. This is not your current state. This is just how you were. And what Paul is highlighting, he says, this is how you were. This is how you are now, but this is how you were. And Paul is highlighting a fundamental, a fundamental that every believer has to have grasp on. Every believer has to be able to speak on this gap. Every believer has to be able to speak on, write this word down, separation. 
You were here, now you're here. Jesus is in the third heaven. There's a place for you up there now. You were down here, separate from God, but now there's a place for you up there. Separation, this is the gap, this gap between where you were and where you are. This is why Jesus Christ is so important. The only way to close this gap is Jesus Christ. Grit can't do it. Money can't do it. DNA can't do it. Fame can't do it. Without Jesus Christ, you, me, and every single believer from this political party, that political party, this side of the country, that side of the country, this generation, that generation, this church, that church, this race, that race, this gender, that gender, every single believer without Jesus Christ is separated from God. That is the thing that unifies mankind in every walk of life is every single man, woman, and child without Jesus Christ is separated from God. And that has been the problem that's been plaguing mankind since the very beginning. Since Adam and Eve, separation has been plaguing mankind. Now, Paul uses the word dead. You were dead in Ephesians 2.1, but he didn't mean physically dead. He's not looking at them going, you're in a grave, you're, you're dead. He was describing their existence. You're existing as a dead person. And this statement in this verse is a callback to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Genesis 2, 17, if you know anything about Adam and Eve, this is that story, right? This is the, this is the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 17 says, but you, this is God's command to mankind. He says, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly, and he uses this word for the first time in Scripture, first mention of death or dying, is right here. He says, in the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. To grasp Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead, we have to understand, we have to know from a biblical standpoint what the word death means. It can't doesn't mean what we've defined it as or what society has defined it as. We have to know that biblically speaking, the word death means separation. That is what the word death means in Scripture. Death means separation. And for such a long time, we have wrongly defined death as to mean extinction, to mean um, uh, annihilation, the non-existence, or even unconscious. That's what we've defined. You're, you die when you're unconscious. When you, when, you, when you lose consciousness from your body and you're gone, you're dead. That's not death, biblically speaking. That's a false line of thinking. Death in the Bible, everywhere, I don't care what type of death you look at, where you look at it in Scripture, death in the Bible, the definition of death is separation. And I'll prove it to you. Death in a marriage. You look at the death of a marriage. When does a marriage die? A marriage dies when one spouse separates from another. Albeit, albeit the separation comes because one spouse lost their life or because one spouse lost their love for the other. A marriage dies when one spouse separates from Another, Matthew chapter 19, verse 5, Jesus actually utilized that word. He said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Verse 6, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Anytime that there is a separation in a marriage, that is the death or the end of that marriage. Death equals separation. You can look at it as a physical death or the physical body. When someone physically dies, when they go into the grave, their soul separates from their body. There is a separation. The body goes into the grave and the soul goes back to God. And if you think I'm making that up, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. It says, and the dust or the body from the dust you were formed to the dust you will return. The dust, the body returns to the ground where it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. There's a separation of the two. Write this down. Have it somewhere. The biblical definition of death is separation. The biblical definition of death is separation. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, says that we were dead. It means that we were separated from God. We're no longer, but we were separated from God. And the reason that we were separated from God was because of our transgressions and our sins. And these are words that have just become almost just like we hear transgression and sins and we just shut our brains off. And that's just what church people say. Well, read it what it means. The Greek word for 
I mean, it's the Greek word for transgression is the word uh, paraptoma, and it means trespass. That is the Greek word for transgression, paraptoma, which means trespass. What is trespassing? It's a cop. We know this one, bro. Trespassing is you were found somewhere that you shouldn't be. Trespass means that you are operating somewhere that you did not have permission to be in. The legal definition of trespassing is entering, and this is kind of across the board. Each state kind of has a slight different definition of it, but the basic legal construct is you trespass when you enter and or remain on another's property without permission because your presence encroaches on the owner's privacy or interests. Human beings, according to Genesis 2.17, were not allowed to be in sin. In our presence in sin, we were found to be in a place that we were not allowed to be. We were not ever granted the opportunity to be in. And when we stepped into that place, we trespassed. And every single person has done it. The word for sin, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's harmatia. And this is a term that it's actually, it's actually the best way to understand sin or harmatia is uh, basketball. Basketball. You only get a point if you get the ball in the hoop. And if you miss, it's probably still too fresh to talk about. But, I mean, Arizona lost to Princeton because we missed a game-winning shot. We had a chance to, I mean, we should have never been that close, but, hey, it happens. We had a chance to go ahead, but we shot the ball and we missed. Because we missed... Our miss disqualified us from the March Madness tournament. Even though we had a great record, even though we were, I think, number two ranked on on our part of the bracket, we were, I had a great season. I mean, Pac-12 champions, back-to-back Pac-12 champions, it doesn't matter. We missed. We missed that shot, and that miss disqualified us from a chance to win a championship in the 2022-2023 season. And once we're separated, we're helpless. There's nothing we can do. And church, we have to wake up because that's the problem. The problem is separation. The problem is not a program. The problem is not how well you do or don't do something. The problem is not branding. The problem is not all these things that we make it out to be. Guys, the problem that has been plaguing humanity for eternity since really the beginning, is separation. We are separate from God without Jesus Christ. And when we're separated from God, we are helpless. And we should know that. Because there was a time, if you're a believer in Christ, that you were like that. That's what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 talks about. He says, in, it's why Paul says, in which you used to live. There was a time you were separated from God and you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the, here's a word that should be a buzzword, air from last week. Ruler of the kingdom of the air, the first heaven. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And if you notice that word spirit, it's a lowercase s. I don't have time to explain why it's a lowercase s. I don't have time to explain why authority is given to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, I'm just gonna. Have to, I just all I have time to do really tell you about is what, what that means. When humanity separated itself from God in Genesis chapter three, when we separated ourselves from God, Satan, the adversary, he was given a measure of authority here. In the first heavenly realm. Here on earth, Satan was given a measure of. Authority again. We I'm now how have near the time to dive into why, but I can't point you to to the what because the what that you need to know is that not only was Satan given a measure of authority, but the world order that we experience today was set up on that authority that was given to Satan. The way that the world operates today was set up on that authority, and you can look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, John chapter 16. You can look at 1 Corinthians 4 if you want to go look in and, and read it for yourself. But the world runs according to the authority, the authority that was given to Satan, and that authority is designed to keep us in a position of separation from God. Satan is trying to get human beings to worship anything else other than 
God. And our world has been set up according to that authority. And without Jesus Christ, human beings, the people that we rub elbows with every single day, without Jesus Christ, human beings are powerless, powerless to set themselves free from that authority. And Jesus Christ, by doing what he did, decided that he was going to to work through his church, the body of believers, the church, to help solve the problem. Human beings, we cannot do it in our own strength. We just can't. And I believe that verse 3 exists because of the word now that Paul said in verse 2. Because if you remember, verse 1, Paul said we were separated but no longer are because we believe in Jesus. Verse 2 says that the authority that Satan has is now or still. Remember, verse 1 was were, past tense, but now we are, present tense, right? We were separated, however, we no longer are. Verse 2, however, Satan is still at work now. All of that is said, I believe, is to point our attention to verse 3. Verse 3 is to remind us that this fight is still going on, that we can't just look at this through the lens of, I'm good, I'll pray for y'all. I believe that verse 2 exists to remind us that this is still going on. There's still work to do. And verse 3 is designed to get to to trigger the empathy. Because verse 3 exists to remind us that we too at one point were powerless. Verse 3 really should create a flip in the way that we view our daily life. Should create a flip in the way that we approach. Verse 3 should create a flip from doing what maybe we want to do or what's comfortable or maybe what was modeled before us in a book that we read one way, someplace, it should flip from doing what I want to do to what I believe that God is leading me to do, what Jesus is leading me to do, because Jesus is the head, we're the hands and feet. And if Jesus is leading you to do something that is countercultural, we are obligated to do that because the church is an organism, not an organization. It means it, 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 it flexes. It, it's flexible. You have to adapt to the season around you. You have to adapt to the situations around you. We can't do the same things that we were doing in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 70s, 60s. You have to be adaptable. You have to study the atmosphere around you, which means when God gives you a vision, you have to sell out to that vision, not someone else's vision, the vision that God has given you, provided it aligns with Scripture. Because verse 3 says, all of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. When we do what's comfortable, when we do what we want to do, when we give into our fears and instead of having faith and following Jesus and saying, listen, you are Lord, which means you are owner, which means if you are asking me to do something that scares the daylights out of me, if you're asking me to do something that is countercultural, if you're asking me to do something I can't even explain, and when people say, what are you doing? You go, I don't know. We still have to trust because Jesus is the head. And if we can confirm it in Scripture, because my sheep know my voice, John 10, Jesus is not going to ask us to do things that are countercultural to his word. That's why we have to know our Bibles. But when he asks us to do things, When he's asking us to solve the problem by going out into the world, we have to be willing to do it, even if it doesn't look normal. We have to be willing to do it. Because people who are separated from God, Paul reminds us that we were at one time in that same position, and by nature we were deserving of wrath. What does that word wrath mean? It's an ugly word. It's not a very Christian or churchy word. What does that word wrath mean? It's a Greek word. It's orge. That's what the word wrath means, and or that's, that's, that's where the, the Greek or where our English word comes from. And the best way I could describe what orge means or what I, or what what wrath means is uh, to give you to have you picture God's wrath similar to uh, water that's piling up behind a dam, right? You've got this you've got this dam, and water's rushing to it. And you know what? This dam will hold for a little while. It will, but sooner or later, as the pressure continues to pile up, the pressure, the rushing water could be God's wrath, God's anger against mankind. Eventually, eventually that dam is going to break, and eventually that wrath is going to spew all over mankind, and anyone that does not have their identity in Jesus Christ is going to be on the receiving end of that wrath. That's not pretty preaching. You don't put that on a t-shirt, but that's what this means. It's eventually going to break. It's building and building and building, and one day it's going to break, and it's going to be unleashed on everyone who is separated from him. That should trigger us a little bit. That should cause us to go, I may not like it, I may not understand it, but I want to fix it. 
the interesting thing about fears, because fears are the things that get us tripped up. The interesting thing about fears, did you know that every possible phobia or fear that exists, that we have at least discovered or given a name to, every fear has a hierarchy, or at least in psychology, they call it a feararchy. In other words, every single fear, regardless of what it is, every single fear comes back down to the same foundational issue. And won't, won't you be shocked to find out what that foundational issue is? Every fear that every human being experiences at its core has its origins in this one, one feeling, separation. Every single fear stems from that thought right there or that feeling or that emotion, separation or death. Psychology uses it interchangeably. So separation or death. But verse 4 says the best word in the Bible, but. Because every single person is separate from God. And every single person, regardless of their fear, without Jesus Christ, is subjugated to that wrath. But there's a solution. There's a solution. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. Humanity is rich, is, is rich in sin. Mankind is rich in sin. However, we are rich in trespasses. We are rich in doing things we shouldn't have done. However, while mankind was rich in doing things we shouldn't have done, God is rich in mercy. Mercy means compassion. Mercy means forgiveness. It's extended to someone who is undeserving of it. Mercy is extended to someone who deserves wrath. Mercy is extended to someone who deserves to be on the, on the receiving end of God's wrath. But he says, I'm not. Even though we deserve it, all of us deserve it. God's extending mercy. Mercy has to come from above, and it has in a big way. It's undeserved, but it's coming, and it's here, and it's closed the gap. God's mercy through his son, Jesus Christ, has closed the gap. It's Mercy is the only explanation for what Jesus did on our behalf. He who had no sin became sin so that we might be reconciled to Christ, or so we be reconciled to God, and it's why we have to wake up. It's why we have to wake up. We have to stop doing the things in church that are just not, they're just programs. They make us feel good. They might inform us, but are they solving the problem? And when somebody asks you a question, cool, thank you for highlighting that. What are we doing? Man, I would love to dive into that. But ask me that question in a year. Ask me that question in a year. I have a whole lot of answers, but I can tell you where it starts from. I can tell you what it originates. It originates from this idea of waking up. Our fears will keep us from doing the things that God is leading us to do. Our fears will keep us paralyzed. Our fears will keep us playing it safe. But when you look at the gap and you think about God's wrath and you think about those you care about and those you love, and you think about, I was deserving of God's wrath at one time. Guys, the world, I, I said it last week, the church doesn't need the world, but the world needs the church probably now more than ever. The fate of the world is dependent, depending on whether they know Jesus or not. And we as believers have got to be able to share the gospel. And we're really good. We are really good at knowing a lot of information about God. We're really good at putting on good programs. We're really good at doing good things. But can we share the gospel with anyone at any time, knowing when to, when to push, when to pull back, and when to pray? Do we know how to share the gospel? And that's what's been convicting me. Is I'm really good at teaching people about God, but I have not done a good job at sharing the gospel, showing what it looks like. You, you can't just point the way you got to clear a path. And that's what this little bracelet reminds me of, and that's why I'll be going to Dallas here in about a month and a half to not just observe it, but learn how to do it myself so that I can teach others how to do it because we got to be willing to share the gospel because as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, all of this is from God. It's not because of anything that a man did. All of this, this mercy, this, 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 this mission, this, this, this purpose that we have, all of it, salvation, it's all from God who reconciled us to himself. God closed the gap through Jesus. We didn't close the gap. God closed the gap. He reconciled us, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the only ministry I'm concerned about in the church is this right here. I'm not concerned about the, the, the ministry of doing good things or the ministry of, of preaching good sermons. I am concerned with the ministry of reconciliation, sharing the gospel so that we can close the gap. That is it. 
I'm not trying to build an empire. I'm not trying to build a following. I'm not trying to build this over. We have got to become concerned with the ministry of reconciliation. I don't care where you go to church. I care that you are pushing the church mission forward. That is the mission of reconciliation. That is what Jesus Christ died for. Pastors, believers, guys, we have to come together. We have to work together because pastors are drowning. They can't do everything themselves. They don't have the minds. They don't have the resources. They don't have the capacity, the mental ability. And we have to, I, 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 the vision statement of vision is see why God chose you. I tell people all the time, listen, if God's put it on your heart, do it. How can I come alongside you to help you? You don't have to ask permission, just communicate intentions and we'll come alongside you to help anything that we can do. And I, pastors, I pray that you give you give people in your church permission to do that. We got to take our hands off the wheel. We can guide and steward by all means, but give people give the Holy Spirit a chance to speak through people because we have to work together to further the message of reconciliation. Because verse 19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, not counting our trespasses against us, not counting the places that we shouldn't have been against us. He has and he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We gotta learn how to share the gospel and make it plain so everyone knows it. And I guarantee you, by year's end, it'll be plain that I don't care if you're five fifty or anywhere between <laughs> Five and 50 wasn't a good choice. But nonetheless, I don't care. If you can understand, we're going to teach you how to share the gospel. That's what I'm committing my the rest of the year to. And we, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors. And through God, we were making his appeal, or sorry, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. An ambassador is a representative on foreign soil. This isn't our home. That's our home. The third heaven, the place that Jesus prepared for us, those who believe in Jesus, that's our home. We're simply ambassadors here on foreign soil, being an ambassador for Christ. And then I phrase appeal through us. I'm going to show you why that makes sense next week. But verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is what the world needs right here. This is what the world needs. The world needs Jesus. The world doesn't need money. The world doesn't need fame. The world doesn't need a following. The world doesn't need good works. The world doesn't. The world needs Jesus. Not to sound corny, but I was, I'm watching Power Rangers with my kids and taking them through the original series. And there's this one episode where everything's looking horrible. They're losing all their resources, and you know, they just kind of want to quit and give up and just kind of say the adversary won. You know, won. And the Red Ranger, he's the leader of the group at the time, and he says, "You know, the world needs us, Rangers." And uh, not to sound corny, but I'm going to sound corny anyway. You know, if you've given your life to Christ, you know, you are a power ranger. <laughs> you really are. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. I can show it to you. You are a power ranger. And the world needs us, rangers. Church, the world needs us. We have to come together, work together. Well, how come the world needs us? Why can't I? Mean, I'm good. Why does the world need us? Well, guys, because the dam's going to break at some point. At some point, this whole thing is going to stop. It hasn't broken yet, though, which means there's still time. There's still time for people to experience the mercy that God has given us through his son, Jesus. Mercy that according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, it's that mercy that made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and our transgressions, it's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ. That's why baptism is so symbolic. It's this idea we were buried, we're dead to ourselves, and we are raised up with Christ, raised up to the third heaven, raised to live in a new life, raised to the place that we were belong. We were never meant to be separated from God. We were, re we, we were never, God's up here, we're down here. We were never meant to do this. We we're always supposed to be with him. We separated ourselves. He's raised us up and put us back with him. That's what baptism is so symbolic of. And that we were raised up with Christ and seated, or he, he seated us, us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus, to be in Christ means no more division. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 28, that's how they put it. There's nothing, we, we, all these things that divide us according to the kingdom that the adversary set up. We divide ourselves by race. We divide ourselves by gender. We divide ourselves by status. We divide ourselves by where we affiliate. We divide ourselves by all these things. And Paul says in Galatians, like, no more. Your identity is Jesus. You clothe yourself with Jesus. That is your identity. That's who you are. And what we're going to talk about next week is why the world needs to know. I'm just going to say that. Why the world needs to know that. 
We're going to talk about why the world needs to know that our identity is in Jesus and how God has already set you up to share that. But that's next week. But everything that we do, everything that we do is founded upon Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that all of us wake up. Wake up to that. If that means do what's scary, do it. If that means do what you know in your heart you need to do, do it. Do what's going to put you in a position to share Jesus Christ with the world. As we're going to learn next week, you've already been teed up. The thing that's keeping us from taking the step forward is fear. There's no reason to be fear, 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 be fearful. It doesn't mean that it's not there, but there's no reason to succumb to it. Guys, we can't succumb to the fear because the world needs Jesus, and Jesus has chosen to reveal himself through the church. So we have to step in and be the hands and feet of Jesus. We have to adopt the we have to adopt the mission of reconciliation. Even if it looks different. At the end of the day, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Paul used a boat. You might have to use the internet. You might have to go. Paul had to go to the Gentiles. You weren't supposed to go to the Gentiles as a Jewish person. You might have to go outside the walls. You might have to go outside the norm. You might, as a pastor, have to go two or three states away and talk to somebody and say, teach me how to do this because I don't know how to do it. You may have to do that. If we can humble ourselves, guess what? God will put us in a position because he already has. He will put us in a position to be able to be used by him to help with the message of reconciliation, being able to share the gospel so that we can lead as many people to Jesus and to God before that dam breaks. Let's be a part of it. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this message. I thank you so much for the opportunity to share it. And while it's uncomfortable, and while life can get uncomfortable, and while shifting is uncomfortable, and why it's unsettling, what's, uh, what's so amazing is you're, you're always true, you're always constant. And I can't wait to share next week how you have already set us up to do it, and why we are wasting so much energy trying to set ourselves up, when you have already set us up to share the message of Jesus Christ, to share the hope that exists in Jesus Christ. I pray, I pray that we become a church that is obsessed with that, obsessed with the message of reconciliation, obsessed with learning how to share the gospel. And I pray that you become, I pray that, 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 that your word becomes a beacon to so many people and that people begin to realize, whoa, I am way more set up than I thought I was. And I pray that people continue to fall in love with you in a way that, had, that, that we haven't seen since Pentecost in our cities, in our workplaces, in our churches. Here comes the church. Put it to you that way. It happens one life at a time. I pray that people realize that it may look different, but they may have been born for such a time as this. So again, Father, we thank you. We love you. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You guys have a great week. See you next time. Bye, y'all.